Ladies and gentlemen, so if uh, any of you have been uh, asking yourselves is uh, uh, the trip uh, to Aspen a good investment, then uh, uh, you just go to a restaurant. Uh, I think Marie Valentin remembers the name, I don't. And you ask the waiters, uh, what's the resilience? And uh, the lady will tell you right off, oh, it's bouncing back. So if you don't find any better resilience uh, definition in, uh, in Aspen in, during this week, we can always go back to this one and, and consider it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's the waiters. <laughs> so uh, that's part probably of our cycle, because in our cycle, we actually have to think and understand how the general public appreciates uh, all the effort which is done in the meetings, also the meeting like this one. And uh, in my talk, I would like to uh, try to see if we can make a bridge between risk and resilience and uh, see what's the role in this process of the new unknown so-called emerging risks and uh, uh, how in all this process uh, um, um, indicators uh, the derived from different sources can help us. You can imagine that addressing any of these single issues as such would uh, actually occupy a lot of a talk, but I hope that uh, uh, within uh, um, the examples which I'm going to present and a proposal for a new concept which is going to come, um, there will be some material for uh, a good discussion and uh, maybe further thoughts uh, among the group. So if uh, we want to talk about uh, the particular thing which uh, is linking uh, the resilience cycle and uh, uh, new unknown risks, uh, we will essentially talk about this event triggering this cycle and uh, leading uh, to the loss of functionality and uh, uh, further, um, so to say, uh, um, phases of the resilience cycle. In th that context, we very often forget and in our considerations uh, do not uh, uh, do uh, pro appropriate mapping of uh, the whole landscape, which would include not only resilience, but also all um, other terms, uh, risk, uh, vulnerability, temporality, which uh, was not mentioned so often here, adaptation as a sort of a second definition of resilience, yes, and uh, in my approach uh, uh, presented here, we'll be very much referring to that, what Igor was presenting uh, yesterday, so to say, putting the risk uh, as a point in, uh, in this cycle. In um, terms of uh, uh, emerging risks, we might uh, uh, remind ourselves, uh, without uh, going back to Donald Rumsfeld or anyone uh, uh, from that class, that uh, uh, we actually um, uh, have uh, uh, the most of our, or the interesting risks, the most interesting risks we talk about are actually in this gray area here. Not uh, in this area where we have uh, good knowledge about outcomes or good uh, knowledge about uh, likelihoods. So. Uh, if you just uh, go backwards and look uh, for, the, for the example behind us, I didn't put Paris, uh, simply didn't want to, to, to search actuality in this one, but you will see that in all these events we actually um, had uh, one symptom which was, uh, I think, overlooked over the time. And this was the symptom of uh, the don't worry about it, you know, um, it was, uh, it was uh, an example which is uh, 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 very often quoted, but uh, not uh, very often taken as a, as a good starting point, that in Pearl Harbor we actually also had a, an early warning, uh, which was uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, not leading to an appropriate uh, further action. So when we, when we do this, uh, um, this, uh, uh, um, this type of thinking, when we look at how to map the landscape, I think uh, we shouldn't maybe go back down to the Aspen waitress, but should uh, avoid all the things which may lead us to overframing the situation. So if we want to uh, look at, uh, you probably know that how many church councils have been devoted to the definition of what's God and what God is not, uh, that if we want to, to, to end up and, uh, um, with something which is working, we should try to, to rely on that's what's present on the ground and avoid over complexity of the overall things which uh, can make out of the resilience a sort of a religion science. 
And uh, uh, in that sense, uh, we should also look at the establishing the bridge between uh, the um, uh, resilience and, uh, and risks. And uh, when bridging this river, we should uh, probably uh, uh, not try to make the bridges uh, uh, which actually lead, uh, lead nowhere. So uh, that's just uh, for, for you. So in, in that sense, um, there is an interesting uh, part of the approach in Europe, which may be useful for, uh, for the United States, which is saying that uh, standards and um, a part of the innovation can actually help in enhance uh, uh, the communication and uh, the innovation processes such in itself. So, um, uh, in, in that sense, uh, this bridging should actually uh, uh, help us uh, provide a better basis for the benchmarking indicators indi and, and, for instance, scorecards which are developed. We should think who is applying them and who is accepting their results, how they are managed then. ISO 31000 is one of these cornerstones of this process and in itself it is just one part of uh, uh, an overall, um, I would call it, uh, infrastructures of standards dealing in the end of the day with risk and resilience and uh, probably the most interesting one could be uh, the very new one uh, which is um, the business continuity standard not even mentioned at uh, this one, it's ISO 22301. Uh, different other uh, documents are dealing with vocabulary definition and similar and uh, I will not go into, into this one. I will just mention that overstandardization can on its own become uh, a risk. I would just remind you that uh, yesterday uh, somebody mentioned that resilience is positive, risk is negative. In the basic definition of ISO 31000, risk is not qualified as bad or good. It is just considered as threat and opportunity. So in that terms, when we uh, talk about uh, risk uh, governance and assessment frameworks, we should uh, then see where the place of both emerging risks and resilience could be. And we are currently working on something which is, uh, has taken a DIN specification, uh, DIN document, uh, from 2013, this is this uh, 16,649 document, which in itself will be extended with the elements of resilience, because in its application cases, dealing uh, primarily with the technology, and I'm coming from engineering and technology side, not dealing too much with cities, civil infrastructures, and so, um, we have uh, looked at this technology um, emerging risks and correspondingly in the um, in the future work uh, uh, technology resilience. So if you look at the uh, at, at these elements, you can find them in different technologies. For instance, if you look at the uh, system, how the <coughs> which looks at the at the, at the elements of searching for the uh, management of emerging risks and uh, uh, corresponding response in the area of, of new technologies, you will see a big similarity between such a system as a management system for Florence or, or so. Um, what is often pr uh, 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 forgotten in these systems is predicting a uh, feature. So once when we know, once when we have these data, how are we going to predict the behavior of systems or behavior of people? That's something which is still a, a sort of an open thing. And here you have an example of fracking technology. Probably for this meeting, the more interesting would be a, the next example of a national health system. That is actually an example from Austrian health systems where we have seen that uh, uh, you know, some policies and some trends uh, simply don't go well together and uh, that we have to put social networks, exposure to toxic substances and um, other uh, sets of data together in order to see and have a better insight in this data. So in uh, that sense, uh, um, uh, we come to, the, to this big data analysis, which looks at the system of patients and diseases and uh, then tries to make an analysis and prediction on the qualitative basis, we have discussed yesterday an example, can we see the religion uh, in numbers? But yes, this is approximately the same story. So we see uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in with such, such kind of an analysis, um, um, uh, the confirmation for that, what experts will know uh, intuitively and describe 
qualitatively. But in, when doing this type of analysis, when you see what's, how the situation changes with age groups, you can find out uh, that uh, um, at the end of the day, you can identify these diseases or these problems for the resilience, which you can uh, uh, do well when preventing, and those where you cannot. And so uh, you can, for your decision making, have a solid basis for investing there where you have uh, the good chances of success. So looking backwards in this data is always something which helps and very often forgotten in this data. So we, we are taking snapshots, we are not predicting it forward, and we are very often not looking backwards in the data. This example here exactly for the health system shows how it um, is important because there you can find the causes. So um, the message which comes out of this, um, I'm not saying that what is BS, big data analysis uh, without big theory behind it is really not leading nowhere. I mean, it's going to lead to a lot of, uh, of, of charts and, and nice uh, uh, presentations and things like that, but it's not going to lead uh, um, to lead uh, to a bit to good result. The next example is uh, going to tell us one thing which is also important in this area that we very often look at the strong signals. The examples which I've shown were based on strong signals. The next thing is, uh, you know, which we work with not European Union, but uh, European industry, is uh, uh, working uh, on the, uh, so to say, weak signals. And these weak signals, uh, if you do a sort of a multiplex analysis on these ones, um, allow to identify these sources and these signals which are really uh, considered more as a noise than a real signal. And how to identify uh, those which can matter is something which we propose in our research now and is basing on the analysis of how the previous weak signals have developed. So this is something which for insurance industry can help us make a map like this for, from different ri risks. And of course, as Marie Valentin says, nowadays everybody just replaces word risk with uh, resilience. But uh, of course, if you consider improving resilience as a next step after your risk analysis, you can come to uh, good results by uh, uh, looking at these things this way. So to conclude now about uh, the new risks and re resilience, we can say that when the new risk causes um, uh, the start of the resilience cycle, uh, being it an unknown or uh, event or an emerging risk, we can look in different states for different types of applications to the sources and indicators which are coming from different sources. Uh, we have been facing the problem how to put these indicators on the same level, how to analyze them. And um, uh, one of the, of the possibilities is the one which has been resulting from these examples. Of course, you can look at different layers of data and try to derive out of these resilience indicators. You can try to uh, use and then reformulate these indicators in, uh, so to say, almost uh, uh, quantitative rules and so to the, the same types of indicators as those which are used, for instance, in the, in the scorecards and, and checklists. And uh, in uh, that sense, um, the proposal which we have made is the proposal of putting that in something which we call resilience cube. Resilience cube would then be putting the standard indicators coming from the yes, from coming from the um, from the scorecard checklists and so on on one axis, putting those coming from the big and open data on the other one, and using then resilience metrics as a tool which can help us in that sense have a better overview and bet better uh, mapping. Why? Because at the end of the day, decision will be based on some sort of a rating and benchmarking and identification of the critical elements in the whole structure's weak links. Warning as before made. Conclude. Um, we have a chance, I think, not the least uh, uh, on this meeting, but uh, also in everything what we do now, to try to integrate the things a little bit better to make this bridge between risk and resilience um, more tangible, not uh, uh, without end uh, as the bridges which I've shown before, 
and uh, uh, use the means of standards as a means of communication and putting everybody on the same page. We are at this moment working on with China and, uh, and, and, and Germany, uh, also uh, uh, French AFNOR will probably join the effort, on something which is running as Dean Spec International. It will uh, uh, include uh, uh, on ISO side uh, the committees uh, for risk, this is Technical Committee 262, and for Resilience, Technical Committee 292. And it would be very nice to uh, uh, have a, uh, so to say, a discussion during this rest of, reminder of this week. Is there any interest on the US side to join this effort? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to point out there is an ISO standard that's in preparation for um, uh, resilient and sustainable cities, ISO 37120, right. and it's being led out of Canada, Yeah. so they're going to be basing it on 100 different indicators. Have you considered getting involved in that <laughs> effort? Um, for sure. The problem at this moment in the standards on the ISO level is uh, that each ISO committee uh, in this area works on its own. Uh, they uh, disregard and uh, actually sometimes I think deliberately obstruct the efforts of the others. So a uh, uh, most uh, uh, so notorious example is that after years ISO 9000 standard for quality has adopted uh, the definition of risk in its text in 2015, which of course is not the definition from uh, uh, the ISO guide 73 or the definition from ISO 31000. The same thing happens on the, on the other areas and I think that uh, uh, you know, behind every, each of these standards there is some group, some uh, national group, some industry group and uh, this has to be taken into account and we, that's what my, uh, the reason for my comment, the standardization can be, uh, so to say, a tool and vehicle to overcome some of these problems, but as it runs now, it can be a cause uh, for new problems itself. Okay, one more question. Anyone? Yeah, I, I mean, more, more, more of a comment. I'm just reflecting upon your, pr your presentation and, and Billy's presentation and seeing where there is a potential convergence, because what I got from your presentation was, was quite technical, presentation. Sorry. I was, what I was wondering in my head about where's the social in all of this? It's interesting. In this session, we've uh, talked about resilience and we've talked about societal resilience. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Are they the same things? Quite. So that's more of a, more of a reflection than, than, a, than a question. Uh, I, I would say, you know, that the, uh, this distinction between uh, sociology and the uh, technical aspect of Which the whole story is, uh, uh, I think, something which has to be overcome. We cannot live with this anymore because technology, uh, you look how you, you, how you uh, operate today, how integral part of your daily, daily life technology has become, especially information technology, and you will understand that uh, when we now uh, solve the, 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 the technological issues, we cannot look at them uh, without uh, uh, in involving this uh, social part. And on the other hand, we cannot consider social developments without uh, looking at technology.